Um, I don't know if you're speaking to us, but you're on mute. Uh, whoever's listed as Wendy Goodlow. We go. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Hancock. Some of you know me, most of you don't. I'm here in Bracketville on Juneteenth. It's a very special Juneteenth because it's now a national holiday. Uh, but do keep in mind that the Seminoles celebrate Juneteenth in solidarity with state race people because when uh, slavery was in this country, were not here. They didn't come from Mexico until, what, 1872. So they weren't slaves here at that time. I had the privilege many years ago, in the mid-1970s, of being allowed, introduced to the of the black center is a language which is injured. Very, very few people left to speak elderly. I was very lucky to be able to talk to the last surviving speakers. Those people are not here today. And it's, it's a tragedy of sorts when a people lose its language and many have the same thing, which is a people without its own language is only half a people. I was for years a professional in the University of Texas and one of the sayings in linguistics is that language is the vehicle of culture. In other words, if you really have to know a culture and preserve a culture, you have to know the language that carries that culture. So you might say, well, since the seminal language is just about gone, why bother making an effort to relearn it, to learn it at all? Well, for that very reason that a whole part of a person's identity is that person's language. And what makes a seminal a seminal, traditionally at least, was the language. There's no reason at all that it cannot be revived, relearned. It's not a difficult language, but it's a special sort of language and it has a history that has worked against it. And that's what I want to talk about today uh, from a linguistic point of view. My, mo my, my involvement with the seminars is twofold. One part is linguistic, that's how it started. But the other part is that it's become highly personal for me. And I have so many dear, dear friends here now. So I have that connection as well. Um, the Seminole language is, first of all, a Creole language. There are many languages around the world. 
And these are languages that are the result of different populations coming together for one reason or another different languages and they talk to each other. But they don't have a common language to talk to each other. And sometimes those social conditions are pretty horrible. Slavery, very good example of how people speak in different languages, heard it together, in a desperate situation, not needing to talk to each other, panicking, frustrated, frightened. What happens? How do they communicate when they can't? Well, they can. We have something in our brain. Because we are human beings, that allows us to create language. And if you think about it, we are the only living species on the planet that actually has language. And that's because we're able to make it in our brains. So language has a structure, it has a grammar. What it doesn't have in your brain are the words to go into that structure. If you are in a condition, a situation where there are lots and lots of different languages, usually, pretty much always, there's going to be one dominant language, and that's going to be the language of the people that put you into that situation in the first place. So if we're looking back again at the slave trade on the African coast, You've got a bunch of different European nations involved in that. You've got the French, you've got the Portuguese and the Dutch, and you've got the English. And so in the slave trade operated by English speakers, those people who have been taken by force from their homes pushed together, crowded together, trying to communicate, they are hearing English words. They learn the words, but when you learn a language, just stick with English, words are made up of little bits. You've got the base part, and then you've got the endings, right? So to make a plural, for example, you stick an S on the end. One dog, two dogs. If you want to make something past tense, you put an ED on the end. Walk, walked. The first bit stays the same. The endings keep changing. Walked, walks, walking. You don't know, if you don't know the grammar of that language, the only bit that stays still is the first bit. So the brain, and this happens all over the world, it's not just in our situation that involves seminars. Your brain will retain the bits that are fixed and just get rid of the bits that keep changing and you, you cannot figure them out. But if you lose that, you're losing a lot of the grammar as well. For example, if you lose the S on the end, if you don't sound the S, you've lost the way to make a plural. If you lose the ED on the verb, you've lost your way to make the past tense, what, what. When you lose something, you've got to compensate for it. Now, what Creole languages do everywhere is not make up new endings, Real languages have very, very few endings. Instead, you use separate single words to represent those grammatical changes. So what the Creoles that took their words from English, just like Seminole, did, instead of making a plural with an S on the end, 
they put the word for them on the end, because that's plural. So instead of saying dogs, you would say dog them. Right? People them. It never changes. That's how you do it. And that's all you need to know how to make a plural. When it comes to the verbs, you use different little words to show how something is happening. So if it's happening right now, you use, and I'm going to stick with seminal, the word to show that something's happening at the moment, you use the word da. So if you want to say, I am going at this moment, you would say, I da go. Right? If you want to show that it's happened before, you can either leave the da out to just say, I go. So if you wanted to say, I go there, that actually means I went there. Because if you want to say, I'm going there now, you'd have to put the dirt back in there. You can also show that it happened before by putting the word bin in there, I been mean go. If you want to show that you're going to do it, now this is where Seminole is a little bit different from the other Creoles, and I'll come back to this too, because I want to talk about what, when I first met all of y'all, people really didn't know that Seminole, or languages very much like Seminole, were spoken by millions of people outside of Brackettville. They were very surprised to know that. Um, now, of course, they know that. But to show that you're going to do something in Seminole is this little word, N, E N, N. So if you want to say, I will go, you would say, I am go. Now, that N really is shortened down from Gwen. So if you stretch it out, it's I Gwen go. I'm going to go, right? Um, but in, in Seminole, it's, it's just become N. If you want to show that it's over with, it's finished, you use done, a done go. If you want to show that it was over with even before something happened, you can say, I've been done, go. So you can even put these little words together. You could say, I will have gone by putting the future and the done together. I am done gone. And that would mean I will have done gone. By tomorrow, I am done go home. I will have gone home. Um, then other things with, with these sorts of words. In English, if you just want to name a verb, you do it with two, like to walk, to run, to sit, to jump, to scratch. Instead, in seminal, it's fu. So instead of saying, I want to go, you would say, I want for go. I want for go. But that fu can also mean you have to. So you for go, or you have for go. That means you've got to go. Where Creole languages, the ones with English words like, like Seminole, and the other ones, ones with French words, ones with uh, Portuguese words, they all do the same thing. They have different ways of expressing B. English only has B. Something is, something I am, and so on. But the Creole languages are much more precise. First of all, words that describe things are already verbs. So describe words like big, small, red, empty, actually mean to be big, to be small, to be empty. So you don't need a verb. I could say the can empty. I don't need to say the can is empty because empty already means to be empty. Um, and by the same rule, 
since these adjectives are behaving like verbs, because they sort of are verbs, you can put those little verb words with them too. So if I want to say the can will be empty, I can use that same little n word, that little future word, the can and empty. The can will be empty, right? Um, but that is where the equivalent of be is with those sorts of words. Now, if it's the kind of be that means you are something, like he is a teacher, she is a nurse, then you're back to this word de. It sounds the same as the earlier de, meaning either go, but it's a different de. So if you wanted to say he is a teacher, you would say be the teacher. Um, then the other B, and this is where if you know any Spanish, you know the difference between ser and estar. There is a special B in Creole languages, meaning to exist or to be in a place, which is de. So if I wanted to say the can is on the table, where the is means exists on the table, I would say the can de pan de table. And the word is pan, comes from a pan, but you wouldn't say on, you'd say pan. The can de pan de table. And of course, when you're speaking uh, Seminole, you also have to have the accent that goes with it, which I cannot do very well. But I remember asking, I think it was Alfred Gordon, I said, how do you say, how do you say my mother in Seminole? And he said, if you want to say my mother, you say, mi mami. And his whole tone, accent changed. You don't say people, it's people, and so on. So there's a lilt that comes with the, the speech. And you have to copy um, how the old people did it. And there were the younger generations who couldn't speak Seminole, could make fun of their parents by copying their accents. Um, now, what else have we got? So we've got uh, different ways of saying be, to be in a place would be de. Uh, to be a person, it would be but. To be big, nothing at all, just say it be. Um, now, let's look at the words for me and you and him and she and her and all of those kinds of words, which are a little bit different. I is I. You is, it can be you, if it's one person. If it's more than one person, it's Hana. But in Seminole, but not in the other Creole, the cousin languages of Seminole, you cannot say Huna for one person, but you can in Seminole. How Huna de do? You can say that to one person in Seminole. Um, and there we have that de. How Huna de do? How are you doing? What do ail you? What ail you? What's wrong with you? Um, but now the other day to be somewhere, um, you did pun fool. You are a pun foolish. You acted a fool. So you can see the different days and does and so on. So that's the first person. Creole languages also have emphatic versions of some of these words. So you could say, I did go, I'm going. But if you wanted to say emphatically, it's I'm going, not you, then you could say me, me de, but you have to raise your voice, me de go. And you will also very often hear me, um, if you want to say, me no, no, me no, no, 
instead of unknown known. Um, so that's I and me. And me, of course, is just me. Um, you is you or Hannah. He and she and it are all E. Although the emphatic form of E is him. So I could talk about my wife and say E that my wife, even though she's female, there's no sex difference in, in those words. Um, but if you wanted to, if you asked me which one of those ladies is your wife, and I wanted to be emphatic, I'd say him to my wife. Uh, those words are also possessive, so well, not ah, I, ah for I is not possessive. Me is the possessive right there. So I'd say, me can, my can, not I can. That doesn't make sense. But now in the plural, we means we, but it also means us, and it also means our. So if I wanted to say, this is our book, I would say, this the we book. This the we book. This shadow we book. This right here is our book. Um, and if you want to say that there, you can say Dara, if that really old word is Dara, Dara de the we book. And you can start to understand that when you hear people speak in seminar quickly, if you don't know it, you don't understand it. Um, so we can mean us or our or ours and so on. Now, if those words come at the end of the sentence, if I wanted to say this book is ours, then I would have to say this your book that we own. If I wanted to say this book is mine, I'd have to say this your book that we own. That's how you say it's mine. There are words, question words, which are different, quite different from English. For example, if you wanted to say where, the word in Seminole is wisse, wisse. So if you wanted to say, where are you going? Wisse you the go. And if you wanted to make it more of a question still, you could put a da, remember da means be. Do we say you to go? It is where you're going. Do we say you to go? Or, and now let's use huna. Do we say huna to go? Who's going to understand that? Nobody understood it outside. And that's one reason why when the Bakradem heard Seminole being spoken, they, they could make fun of it. They could say, oh, kind of silly talk that is. And that led to internalizing negative attitudes about the language. But uh, maybe I can come back to that in a bit. Um, so Wissa means where. Now, you can take it apart and show that it actually started out as English, it comes from which side? English? You're not speaking English when you're speaking Seminole. You're speaking a whole different language with a whole different grammar. And you've got to keep that in mind. You're not speaking any kind of bad English. Now, you can speak bad Seminole, which you should try not to. And you can speak bad English, and you should try not to do that either. But you've got to keep the two separate. Speak both well. That's the aim. Um, trying to think of some more words 
Uh, like I say, most of them are from English, given the history. Um, and it ties, it ties Seminole into a whole family of related, closely related Creoles. My brother Amadou is sitting right there, and when we're together, we speak a different Creole, which comes from West Africa, thousands of miles away. And yet, if I say in Seminole, we say you the go. How do you say it in Creole? You hear that? It's practically the same thing. Um, I'll give you another one. Um, if I wanted to say in Seminole, I know Binyedian. That means I didn't hear it. I know Binyedian. How would you say it in Creole? I know Binyedian. I know Binyedian. Amazing. Which is why when I came here the first time, and I was talking like that, and it was Miss Charles Wilson, bless her memory, who opened the door for me in Dimery's. I've told this story so many damn times, but she was curious enough for this outsider to be able to talk sort of like her with some gullah mixed in there. She said, can you come back tonight because there's some people going to want to talk to you. I think she was a little bit suspicious. Um, so I did. I went back to one of the meetings after church that same night. Um, and there was nowhere to stay in Bracket back in 75, 76. I, I think I had to go down to Del Rio spend the night. Um, and that's when people were saying, well, how do you know our language when we're the only people that speak it and I said no but no you're not the only people who speak it there are people in many countries numbering in the millions that speak it and then somebody said yeah you remember that Nigerian nurse that was here she sort of could talk like us remember that Jamaican student that was here he sort of sounded like us and then when I went back the next time and I took a bunch of stuff and showed people and that uh, kind of started to change people's opinions but there was still this idea that it's some kind of bad English or broken English and that's because nobody was ever told different from that the teachers in the classroom would tell the children you're not speaking English properly. Probably punish the kids. In Sierra Leone, in Africa, um, when kids in the classroom would speak Creole, the teacher would make them kneel on pencils or stand on one foot with the finger on the ground holding them up for hours as punishments for speaking their own language. And they used to do the same for Spanish speakers in Texas in the schools. It's, it's terrible. So, what can we do, or what can y'all do, to try and save such a precious part of the seminal heritage? Well, simply learn the language. It's not difficult. We've got little grammar. And this is where I can show you this. This is a book, you can print it out. It's lessons, not in Seminole, not in Texas Seminole, but in Louisiana Creole French, because they also have a Creole, but it, is, it has words from French, not words from English. But it's getting lost. It's not in such bad shape as Seminole, but it's, it's really only the old people who know it. They're not passing it on. So there is a big effort to save it. And part of that is to have books, lesson books with sentences and conversations and uh, tape recordings and all that kind of thing. And y'all can do exactly the same thing here. And if you, if you need some 
help with the linguistics, I'm here to. But it's, it's up to y'all to uh, take the initiative to do that. Um, let's get back to the language a little bit. Um, the seminal history is fascinating. It's a great shame that it's not taught in the schools in this state. It's a big part of Texas history. The, you probably now, by now, heard the, the word Gullah. Um, Gullah is the name now being used for a very, very closely related language to Seminole, spoken over on the east, southeast coast of this country, uh, especially on the islands, the Sea Islands off of Carolina and Georgia. Back before the United States was the United States, it was still a British colony or 13 colonies. Florida was Spanish. It wasn't British. But the plantations in Georgia, Carolina, owned by the British, had all kinds of slaves. And the slaves were able when they could to escape and get down into Florida, which was Spanish, enemies of the Brits. So they were safe down there. And they hooked up with the native population. Now, this word Seminole dates back to that time. We associate the name with the Native Americans and with Florida. In fact, when I first learned about Seminoles in Texas, the, I told the guy, you're mistaken. He said, black Seminole. I said, uh-uh, Seminoles aren't black and they don't live in Texas. They're Indians and they live in Florida. No. So I investigated. The word itself comes from a Caribbean native word that means something like fugitive. And it went into, first picked up by the Spanish language. And in Spanish, it's uh, cimarron. The plural of cimarron in Spanish is cimarrones. The native population pronounced cimarrones as cimalones and that got turned around into seminoles but it was first applied not to native americans but to africans they were the first owners of that label but so there were indian seminoles and there were african seminoles in florida the Africans assimilated largely into the native population. They formed alliances. There were certainly intermarriages, not as much as you might think, but there certainly was a lot. And they counted as Native Americans in one respect. When Florida became part of, well, let me back up a bit. Then the 13 colonies won their independence from Britain and became a new country, the United States. Then Florida got taken over and became a new state. Once Florida became part of the United States, Slavery was still legal, and here was a whole free black population in a new American state. So there were raids down into Florida, there were wars, Seminole Wars and so on, trying to capture free Africans to bring them back into slavery. A lot of the native Floridians were able to move successfully to the 
Western territory, Indian territory is not yet a state, but which today, of course, is Oklahoma. And a lot of the native people, as you know, were herded there. The black Seminoles applied to go to as Native Americans. And there was a lot of uh, hassle in all of that, but mostly they were able to get across to Oklahoma or to Indian Territory. But being next to Arkansas, which was a slaveholding state, there were still slave rates. Not looking now for the Native Americans, they were no longer being enslaved, but trying to capture the free Africans, or the, the black Seminoles. So once again, the, uh, a delegation crossed through Texas, down into Mexico, bargained for some land. It's about 125 miles in, which we're talking about Nacimiento, which I think it's 25 square miles, something like that, um, next to the Kikipu. So you've got El Nacimiento de los Negros, right next to El Nacimiento de los Indios, which is the Kikipu. So, there they are in the 1840s, I guess. And they're down there. Meanwhile, Texas is opening up as a new state. They're trying to get white folks moving in and settling. The Lipan Apaches, who are here today, were giving them trouble. So they went down to Nacimiento to recruit the Seminoles who knew, quote, Indian ways uh, to be scouts. The scouts came up in 1872 to join the rangers and moved on to the Fort Clark grounds. But like I said, 1872, after the teeth. Um, and then you know the rest, uh, when, when the garrison was shut down in 1911, I think, everybody had to move off the fort and move across the road or go back to Nascimento. Um, so what we've got here is a population splitting off from the southeast coast, the people speaking Gullah, over there and living a different life with different people in different places. First of all, they were much more closely tied to the Native American people. So you've got Native American words in Seminole. Coming over here, Mexico. So you've got quite a bit of Spanish in there too. Now Gullah doesn't have that. Another difference is that after the ancestors of the Seminoles separated from Georgia, Carolina, Florida, more Africans came in to the coast, a lot from Sierra Leone. So Gullah has got words in it from Africa that they don't have in Seminole. And Seminole has words in it from Indian and Spanish that Gala doesn't have. But if you leave those words out, you're pretty much talking the same thing. Now, Gala is slowly disappearing because where the Gullahs live, it used to be isolated. Even as recent as the 1930s, there were many people on the sea islands had never seen a white person in the United States. Until the 1930s and 40s, you had to get there only by boat. There were no bridges. Now, if you go there, there's golf clubs, hotels, yacht clubs, and English everywhere, tourists everywhere. And so English is hammering Gullah. That hasn't happened here. 
what's happened here in a way is just as sad it's because the generations have not been teaching the children so there are no 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 young people anywhere who can speak it so what we want to do i guess or what what i can imagine would work would be first of all to get something a book like this together but not just conversations and lessons but also bits of history uh stories if anybody can remember stories um songs recipes especially recipes um just bits of history even reproducing photos pictures of ancestors making it interesting and alive uh we have talked for a very long time about having a summer school maybe you know just a couple of weeks here in bracket once a year probably not outside so hot but um a conversation class and so on tries it i i have a language that also is getting lost in some places and what we do is make competitions for children to try and compose in our language um and that's quite successful if there's a reward of some kind um then you get some feedback so all of these things are possible and uh like i said feedback so all of hana who are watching um if you have questions or comments or suggestions now i'm able to hear them join in jump in meka yeri hana Hana, I'm not afraid. Maybe they can. This one. You're unmuted. Maybe they're just being shy. Yeah. So I have a question. Okay, here we got a question. So if um if we just had a class, what is? Sorry, we are just being shy. That's all. Okay. Only people that would be able to be here are going to be virtual and open to anybody that's a descendant. Yeah, that's. Won't be a great cap on that. No, I don't. I don't think they should be. You can never turn away a student. Right. No, so the question was, if we had a summer school, would it only be available to local residents or people who came for it, or would it be like this, um, broadcast? And absolutely, yeah. So for everybody other tribes or other historians that are interested to uh that's up to you all that's not for me to say um remember the the language has been so so private for so long i don't know that people want everyone to know it even now but that's that's your decision not mine i would prefer it to be seminal only i think with scholars and so on that would be a different kind of format somehow i'm talking about like oklahoma seminal. oh like other seminals freeman and so on but well, their seminal would be different from ours in oklahoma yeah no but it's pretty much gone entirely there yeah, uh, and we're we'll woke up with, in nasa nasa yeah when we went to mexico we had a spanish course so they were speaking um after some of the people would not have that spanish yeah um what happened there was when the people left oklahoma to go to mexico some of them didn't go yeah and some of them went halfway the indian seminoles who left with the black seminoles turned around and went back um but there are seminoles in 
Bahamas, in Andrews Island, and in Cuba, and other places besides just and, Mexico. and yeah, of course Mexico. Yeah, I see Nikki's name there. Got a question? Comment? Hit a shame. No, it's, I'm sorry about that. It's it's my um, computer. So one thing, Ian, I heard you mentioned earlier had to do with the, the intonations and it being able to actually add in the lilt and the different tonality. So how do we do that with a language that isn't widely spoken? Is it by working with more Creole speakers? Uh, there have been young people in the bracket community that I've known who could imitate the old people pretty well. And that's about all you're gonna have to go with. I don't know, do, do the really elderly ladies still have a distinct? We don't have that many. No, but, but those who survive, are, do they have a? Well, we have two of them on the thing too, because they know everybody that's still got the Yeah. So Mary Lou's on there, and and Lee Thompson is on there. We can ask them if they know. They're all. Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, I mean, people's accents change. Mine certainly did when I came to live in this country. I started to try and sound like an American. Um. It sort of happens naturally, but it's the language that matters more than anything. So even if you speak it with a state race accent, at least you're speaking your own language. So I have another question. So would we be able to like record you doing some of the languages so we can at least kind of like imitate you? Uh, if it's lost. I mean, uh, yeah, um, I mean, we got? yeah. I could do that. But what would be nice would be for um, divide the audience into two teams and give questions and then the team A asks team B questions and then team B has to reply in Seminole and so on. There are ways to do that, like with Laura, in different chats, and like do breakaways for 15 minutes. Yeah. And once you start to get good, put on little plays or reenactments. Yeah. Okay. Mm hmm. Another Yeri, another Yeri Hannah. Can you hear me? Another Yeri. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Ian, how do you recover a language? Because it seems like there is still some structure left, but is there research? Is there research that we can do to find more words, or with a Creole language, is it kind of? Um, for lack of a better word, a diminution of the language, so that you cr you're creating your own language, which means you may not have as many words. Uh, that's that's a very good point. Yes, if you don't know the original word for something, you've got to put in something else, and you're probably just going to pull it out of English. So, for example. Uh, one of the words in Seminole, an African word that I collected for a cook pot is pingy, pingy. Um, I don't think people know that word now. Um, so you'd say pot, cook pot or something because you don't know the African word. There are some that people remember. I think last time I was here, we were talking about the word bakra. People know Bakra. Um, for some reason, people know a lot of the rude words, which I'm not going to repeat at this moment. But 
people like those rude words. Yes, my um, mother is laughing about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so if, if words are gone, they're gone. And you, you don't want to create a fake seminal language. You absolutely don't want to do that. And it's never gonna, it's only ever gonna be something emotional for anybody who learns it. Just a part of who you are and where you came from because it's never gonna serve you a, a practical purpose. It's gonna serve you an emotional one. So if you run into another seminal on vacation or something, and you can throw out a few words, and it, it just creates a warmth, a, a bond. How hana, how hana to do? I told you another one story, one of my stories that I repeat incessantly, um, which illustrates the intimacy of the language and the privacy of the language. Years ago, at a dedication in the cemetery, I was standing behind a bench where there were some elderly ladies sitting in front of me and another elderly lady came into the cemetery and noticed her friend who was sitting in front of me and she called out to her, hey sister, how are you doing? Something like that in English. Then she came over, gave her a hug and in her ear said it all over again but in Seminole because it had a different function, a more intimate purpose. And that's what it, that's its value right there. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Just a bit. And I have been um, encouraged by Sarah and uh, Natalie. To yeah. Seminole to them. So we're doing pretty good up this way. I have to take it very slow because I have to remember. Yeah. But I got, but I got the accent. Okay. Excellent. You're writing everything down? I don't know. Do you guys write? I don't think they're writing anything down. Hmm. They just, uh, Sarah I, is recording. I take that back. Sarah is recording things that I say. Okay, and good. I'm particularly interested in the thing that amazes them is that the way I'm talking to you now, and I decide to say something in Seminole, all of a sudden it turns into a different pitch. Like, I'm going to kick you all out so you've been in this with me. And that'd be a, that'd be a... Okay. I'm going to my ass if you keep messing with me. I'm not going to mess with you, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you <laughs> with me. No, never. Respect, respect. <laughs> She's giving you a hard time. Don't don't let her bully you like that. Oh, oh I do. I pretty well stand my ground. But it's something that I never noticed that when I'm when I'm speaking, just you know, speaking. But if when I try to say something, start saying something in some of the, the pitch in my voice and everything sounds different. Yeah. Like, oh, how about that? That's well, that's exact. That was the question. Where are we going to learn the pitch of how you speak it? So you can provide that, and I'm sure there's others. Are there everybody who's interested enough in this to be participating right now surely has got something to add? A story, a word, a memory? Save it all. Send it in. Send it to Wendy, I guess. Sarah, she's over there on the east side, but save everything, okay? Yes, I'm sure someone will. I never know when I'm being recorded. Mm -hmm. I never know when I'm being recorded. Yeah. 
probably being recorded now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this is definitely being recorded. Yeah. You're on candid camera. <laughs> Uh, oh, who has a question? Eugene. Eugene, yeah, Eugene Franks. I see you. Well, I had a question because the the you you had mentioned that possibly if you don't have a connection into the Black Seminoles, you can't be involved. My problem is I have a at least a tangential relationship because um, in Ancestry dot com. I show a lot of different connections DNA wise to people who uh, who are part of the Black Seminole family, mm -hmm. and, I, and I believe that um, my Ward family is actually part of it. Are part of the Black Seminoles, but my family ended up in Missouri. So they never went down south, and then I have one relative who. The records say she is from Florida, but I have no idea who any of her family was because she's the only one in the enti in her entire family who made it to Missouri. I have no record of mother, father, brother, sister, any of that, but it looks like the connections I have mm -hmm. are on the same line that she is on. Well, you... <laughs> That's a common question um, where you discover stuff about your family history and you want to connect. And really the very best thing you can do is talk to the oldest members of your family, of your extended family, and get names and dates and fill in the gaps. There, there, are, there are people who claim to be, let's say, Wissians, right? There's no such thing as Wissians, but uh, people who claim to be Wissians. But the real question is, do Wissians think you're a Wissian? You may think you're one, but do the Wissians themselves think you're one? Um, I have... Uh, an acquaintance who thinks he's a seminar. And I mean, desperately, they would love to be one. And he's not, but you know. But that doesn't mean that there's no sincerity there and maybe some actuality there. But you've got to fill in the gaps. And that's not easy. Church records, have you tried that? Baptismal records? There's mm. absolutely nothing um, yeah. on my third great grandmother. There, there's nothing at all. She just appear. She just appears in Missouri, and and the mm -hmm. only the only census record says that she was born in Florida. Well, that tells you something. Black Floridians have a kind of a separate history, given Florida and politics and all of that. So you you may be onto something there, and I bet if you had enough money, you could track it down. It would take a lot of detective work. But the, the, the problem is, I don't think the name that she took has anything to do with her family name. Ah. Well. And, she's, and she is the only one that I know of on that line. Maybe it's best left alone <laughs> if she doesn't want to use her family name. <laughs> I don't think she was given a choice is, 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 oh, is the okay. point. Okay. Any more suggestions? I have one. So I'm being in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. The first time today when I heard you speaking in uh, ASC, um, I, 
I realized that I can understand this better than Ibn Bola. Yeah, yeah. So why is that? Because Bella is turning into English and Seminole is not. Seminole is just disappearing in a different way. If you look at the old Gullah stories from the 1800s, they are like Seminole. So here's another question. So in order to help bring back this language to Wendy's community, um, would it help having Seminole speakers speak with them mm -hmm. and all others communicate? Would that help at all? Give it a try. Yeah. I had a, a, a different language from listening to my grandma. My grandmother speaking to me was that like, she couldn't speak Korean. So she was speaking Mandarin to me. And I learned how to speak Mandarin without going through books. <laughs> so I'm thinking that maybe, maybe your speaking increased the dialogue between. Yeah. yeah, and you know, yeah. 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 some brothers are still busy, right? This is now getting into grander possibilities with what y'all are doing, which is trips to other communities, actual physical visits, even back to Sierra Leone, where the granddaddy Creole comes from. The granddaddy of Seminole is in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the problem with Maybe it would be good to have, like, let's say that we make a workbook that has, like, 20 words. Maybe you could make a comparative workbook that has your words, but you can see the similarities, mm -hmm. or maybe you could borrow a word that we lost from your language, but we have to know that it's coming from your language. So that mm -hmm. you can... I don't know. I was going to work on it. I was just... Yeah, I think you. I don't know if it's true, you know, yeah. Because we're all saying how the language is getting lost. So ours has been contaminated with language. Right? Yeah. Think, not so much. With other languages. Spanish. Well, we don't use words like contaminated. Okay. Well, I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's a negative word. Okay. I um, have a request, and I told her I was going to say her name. So Sarah wants to know if you can tell a story. My name? No, I said I was going to tell that she asked this. Nikki, Sarah, yeah. Nicole, she wants to know if you can tell a story. Me to tell a story? She just texted me. <laughs> In ASC. In ASC. the last time we were here. I'm not, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I won't text That's the, 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 there's a story, there's me telling a story on that tape with yeah. Mary. Okay. About the Ross. Okay. Nikki, stop it, okay? <laughs> I think I think we we're all questioned out. Yeah. So I guess my question would be, what's your advice for our next step? Should we survey everyone that was on this call and sort of ask? What uh, yeah, we don't want this to die a burning. This has to be the, there has to be momentum here. So I hope the people who are participating now intend to stick with the program. I hope they will really try to contribute stuff and give it to you. And maybe Come, come down to bracket, have a little conference or something. Yeah. But we need material. We need stories, recipes, memories, or anything like that. Yeah, here's something. Today, I brought to bracket uh, an African dish called akara. I made it here. 
it is, I don't know if you can see this, that's the recipe for it. It's made from black eyed peas. And I also wrote out the same recipe in Seminole. So we can do the same sort of thing. And if anybody wants a copy of this, just email me and I can just send it to you as an attachment. Um, let me write down my email address and show it. Okay, that's my email address, xulaj at gmx dot com. So, if you want a copy of the recipe in English and Seminole, be happy to send it to you. And I can send you some other story, written stories, I just don't want to read them out. I can send you some written stories in Seminole. And we're making a little grammar book, right? Yeah. So you will be able to buy from here, no? Oh, I don't know. That's, that's your business. Oh, that's another grammar thing. In English, if you show possession, you have to put your apostrophe S. Yes. So if you wanted to say the mother of the boy, you'd have to say the boy's mother. But in Seminole, because there's no endings, you would just say the boy mother without the S on it. If you wanted to say my father's car, you'd say me daddy car without the S because it's a grammar stuck on and you don't have. There are only a couple of stuck on bits in Seminole. And that's with big, bigger, biggest, the bigger, biggest. Those are the only two endings on words like that. Small, smaller, smallest. But uh, no more endings in the whole language. It's all three separate words strung together. Okay. Ian, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I just this is Louise Thompson. Hi. And I want to thank you for uh, being interested in our culture and in our language. I talked to you the last Seminole day when... Um, yes, I remember. Yeah, and um, I've got your dictionary and I'm practicing so that I can say um, a conversation to you or at least a few sentences in, in the Seminole language. Right now, I can sit here thinking of some of the things my great-grandmother um, would say. And, and, um, but my brain is just not able to um, put those words together very well. Can I write them down when you remember them? Yeah. Well, I, I, like I said, she, um, when I was little, and I would be sassy to her, or she would say something to me that I didn't like. I would use, to, I always used to suck my, my teeth, you know. And she used to tell me, the bee that chucked them teeth at me. <laughs> and I always, I always remember she would tell me that uh, when I was, was sassy. But I, I really appreciate what you did. I enjoy it. Yeah. That's great. That's great. What say you did now? I'm sorry? We say you did now. We say you did now. We say who did now. Where are you now? I'd have been in I'd have been no. Washington State. Oh, oh you're way up there. 
Oh, yes. Uh -huh. mm. Are you coming back now for Seminole Day in September? Whenever no, I can. September, yeah. Yeah, whenever I can. Whenever they say we're going to have it, I'll be there. Could, well, then you are one of the people that can imitate the lilt. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. I remember yes. a little bit. But mm -hmm. coming for Seminole Day when they can. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh huh. And I was a little girl. I grew up around this night. Yeah. You know, I had this lady in the day. While I was just seeing you, right? All of the numbers just came back. Really? And I bet there's more people like you. But you know, there, there is a scientific linguistic technique to elicit language for people like yourself, which involves a couple of drinks. <laughs> Amadou, do you think Amadou should say something about this similarity, no? Well, it's very similar, I would say. Everything you said, in, in Alfon Segedo, I got it perfect. But all the words are the same. For example, when you say, who said? Mm -hmm. Who said, who said? Yes. That's, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. That was to everything you said. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's so similar, even after hundreds of years and thousands of miles, they're so similar. Yeah. Well, that's why I feel like I, I have the rights to be here in back of the you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. By my side. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, well, I guess... So all I got. Any more questions? No. So do you want to set up? I think what's tradition is to set up the next Zoom call. <laughs> should this be a monthly thing? Yes. I think maybe we should call everybody first and see what. All right. Coming. Yeah. This this has to be an ongoing series. To to justify the support for it. And the way, I think the way to continue would be to get feedback from all of y'all, even if they're just single questions or words you remembered or something like that or things you didn't understand any sort of feedback that will provide material for our next session. And if we have these, what, hour-long sessions once a month, um, but we've got to fill them with something. So that means participation, not just me talking. Um, so expected from you will be feedback in time for it to be digested and turned around for discussion next month. Does that sound all right? Everybody happy with that? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we are on a roll. So many, so many things start with good intentions and then 
you know, and I, I don't want this to happen. I don't want this to happen. I retired two or three years ago, and now I'm back in the game, and I'm enjoying it. So I look forward to this. Okay? No. Do you want to say something now? I'm switching off. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining. We'll be in touch. Bye. 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 That'll be good. Thank you. Thank you.